giving and offering and come into his courts. Blessed is He. comes in the name of the Lord, our Lord, the Lord and Savior, King of our souls, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, where of glory always, forever, amen. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that this may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of, bre of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place to the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted, so when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Good morning. Um, I hope the uh, Bible verse this morning sounded familiar. We um, read the same verse two weeks ago. Two weeks ago was the last Sunday of, over the fifth Sunday of Toba, which, um, as was explained, is the, uh, when there's five Sundays in a month, it's a blessing, and so we read the Gospel of the Blessing. Um, today is the second Sunday of Emshir, and um, by church um, order, we, we read the same gospel, John, uh, John chapter 6, the feeding of the multitudes. Um, and there's a series of uh, readings from John chapter 6. If you remember last Sunday, 
We also ran, uh, read from uh, John chapter 6. Um, um, it was the first Sunday of Emshir. Uh, and then next Sunday, um, we would normally have read John chapter 6 also, the reading of the, uh, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me shall not hunger. Um, except that next Sunday is the last Sunday before Lent, so we have a different reading. But the church has ordered, and I'm sure, the, a series of readings from John ch chapter 6. And John chapter 6 is a very important gospel. It starts with, as we read this morning, the feeding of the multitudes. It continues with Jesus walking on the sea. And that's a very important um, uh, um, event because it shows that Jesus is above all material things, walking on the sea. He doesn't have... Uh, the forces of the world are not on him. He's above that. Um, and also we see that when St. Peter also walked on the sea, it, it shows us that when we focus on Jesus, we are also above the material things of the world, of the worldly matters. As long as he was focused on Christ, he walked on the sea. When he lost his focus and was not focused on Christ anymore, the world brought him down and he began to sink. And as we heard last Sunday in John chapter 6, it continues with Jesus telling us not to labor, for the food that, that perishes, but to labor for the food which endures, which is ever, uh, for to everlasting life. It continues with Jesus saying that I am the bread of life, which came down from heaven, and that Jesus is the bread of life who comes, to, he who comes to me, Jesus says, shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And then finally, at the end of John chapter 6, Jesus sort of reaches the peak of that, of that chapter and says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. This follows with, a, with some of the disciples of, of, the, of the followers of Jesus actually leaving him. And Jesus looks at his 12 disciples and says, Do you also want to leave? And beautifully, St. Peter tells him, We have left everything for you. Where else do we have to go? You have the words of eternal life. So the entire chapter of John chapter 6 is focused in showing us that Jesus is the bread of life. And that our concern and focus should be on him, on heavenly bread, and not on your earthly bread. So as I mentioned before, the, 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 the gospel reading today is on the miracle of the feeding of the multitudes. And that, miracle is repeat, uh, that reading and that miracle is repeated many times. Um, first of all, it's the only miracle that's read in all four gospels. St. John typically does not repeat things that were said in the other three gospels, but in this one he does repeat it. And it's also, as, as I explained, is repeated in the church readings quite often. And when something is repeated, as all you parents know, when something is important, you repeat it. And there must be a valuable lesson that we could learn from it. Uh, and there's many valuable lessons, actually, that we could learn from this wonderful miracle. Let me, let me step back a little bit and give a little background to this miracle. We live um, in this day and age, in the year 2011 in Chicago, and if I want to buy something, I go to Jewel, I go to Dominic's, and I buy it. There's very little, very few people that are, are short of food in our community and, are, and people that we know. Um, as a matter of fact, if I want to buy a banana, I can go buy a banana tomorrow, although it's not the season of bananas. Bananas are grown nowhere near Chicago. But if I want a banana tomorrow, I go buy a banana and I buy it. So we have a plenty of food and easily accessible to me. But that's not how the world has been. Um, if you look back at the Old Testament times and even more recent times than that, people generally struggled to get food. And because they struggled to, to get food, Many people focused and looked to God to get their food. We read in the Psalms, all, all eyes, the eyes of all look expectedly to you. You give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living, living thing. There's a strong connection with God and providing food to many people in the Bible. There's many, many great examples of that. Maybe the most obvious one is the Israelites as they're crossing the, the, the wilderness and God providing them manna every day for them to eat. And even in other cases, he provided them quail, provided them for them generously for all their needs. Even the feeding of the multitudes, there's a, a miracle in the time of Elisha, where he fed a hundred, through the prayer of God, he fed a hundred men with 20 loaves of bread and grain. And again, they had many left over after that. As I mentioned, having to struggle for food makes you appreciate God. And understand that God is playing a very important role in providing you with that food. When food is abundant, unfortunately, we take not only the food for granted, but we take God for granted. And so when you have miracles like the miracles today, maybe we, we take that for granted. And we, many people ask and say, why doesn't God do miracles now in my life today, in our everyday lives? I think back, I don't know if you 
you remember this goes a little bit fur uh, further back, but the movie Fiddler on the Roof, the main character of the movie um, is, is, has a very good relationship. He's a, a Jewish man living in, in Russia. Um, and he has a very good relationship with God. He's always communicating with God. And at one point, he's, he looks to God and he says, why can't you make me rich? Would it really change the world that much? Would it change your great plan to make me a rich man? Why can't you give me more miracles and provide for me on more food? Um, and I think many people ask that question. Would it, would it change God's plan so much to make me more comfortable, to provide me more food? Why aren't there miracles today like there are back that time in the Bible? Think about it. Um, we have a, um, a trip with the youth coming up next week. Why can't I just bring a couple of pieces of bread? And God will feed that entire group of kids when we go on the outing next week. Wouldn't that be easier than having to have every kid pack their lunch? And, you know, why can't just God provide food lunch for all? It's a church trip after all. Well, St. Augustine has a wonderful commentary on this. So that question isn't just asked in our day. It was asked even back then. And St. Augustine says, there are a lot more miracles than you think. Think of the miracle of the grain that was, uh, that was uh, used as a seed to make that bread that Jesus fed the multitudes with. God multiplies that seed in the earth when it grows. The grain grows, is sown, and is used to fill barns and barns and barns of food. And that food is used to, to make bread and to feed people. But because that happens every single year, nobody's amazed by that miracle. Because that miracle is so constant and so reliable, we take it for granted. Same thing, Jesus, was, as a matter of fact, that same question was asked to Jesus, wasn't it? People asked Jesus, show us a sign that we can believe. And by sign, they mean miracle. Show us a miracle so that we can believe. And Jesus told them, no sign will be shown to you except the sign of Jonah the prophet. What is that miracle? What is that sign of Jonah the prophet? It's the miracle of salvation. The miracle of changing somebody's life. There is no greater miracle than changing somebody's life. The miracle of changing Saul to St. Paul. The miracle of changing Moses to the great Saint Moses the Strong. What benefit is it when, I, when God performs a miracle and your life is not changed? The true miracle is changing somebody's life. And let me give you an example again. This is an example that will ring true to, to all parents out there. If my child is, is having a temper tantrum, screaming, yelling, crying because they want something, I must have this, I must have that, I must have that piece of chocolate before dinner. And they're crying and screaming and yelling. And if I break down and I give him that chocolate, what have I done? Have I changed that child? No. That child is only going to be more spoiled, more stubborn, and just the same behavior hasn't changed. But if I change the child's behavior, if I make that child change to behave in a more appropriate way, that's a bigger effect than to give in to their temper tantrums. The key is to want to change somebody's life. Again, an example is given in the parable of, of the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man goes up to heaven, meets our father Abraham, and, and asks him, send, send somebody down to, to talk to my brother so they can change him so they don't end up like me. And Abraham says to Moses, they already had the, Moses and the prophets. By Moses and the prophets, he means the Old Testament, the words of the Old Testament, the word of God. And Lazarus, said, Lazarus says, no, 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 but if somebody, um, if the rich man says, but if somebody goes down and they see somebody rose from the dead, that will really change him. And Abraham says, even if they see a miracle like that, that still will not change him. People see miracles all the time. There's hundreds and thousands of miracles happening around us all the time. Unfortunately, people explain them away. Or people take them for granted because they, because they happen so often. There's a lot more miracles than we think that we have. Instead, let's change our focus. Instead of wanting to see more miracles, let's want to see God. That's really what our focus should be on life, in our lives. Trusting in God and looking for Him. Jesus actually told us this. First seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He promised them this, if anyone seeks God and looks to God first, he, God will provide for all their needs. The people today in the miracle of the feeding of the multitudes, they trusted in God. They followed him, and he provided for them. He didn't just provide just enough for them. He provided for them generously, like he would do for us. He took five loaves, two fish, and he multiplied them. And with them, he fed 5,000 people. And when they were done, there was leftovers, 12 baskets left over. So after feeding 5,000 men, besides the women and children, they actually ended up with more food than they started with. Think about that. That's how generous he was providing for them. Not only were they satisfied, they all ate as much as they wanted. 
and there's still more food left over. It's almost like the best all-you-can-eat buffet you can ever imagine. The food just kept coming. So you must ask yourself, how do I participate in this all-you-can-eat buffet? Don't we all? And I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about the God's all-you-can-eat buffet of his blessings and his miracles. So I can participate in God's wonderful bounty and blessings and generosity. I first have to understand the power of God. Amos, the prophet in the Old Testament, described God this way. He says, For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thoughts is, and makes the morning darkness, he tends the high place on the earth. The Lord, of, the Lord God of hosts is his name. He's reminding us that God can do anything. God is the creator, the one who created the earth from nothing, who formed the mountains and the winds. He created all that. Whatever situation you're in, however you might think it's hopeless or difficult, God can transform that into victory. So that's the first thing I need to realize, that there is nothing beyond God's power. He is the creator. Second, and I think this is really important, I need to participate with God. I need to be part of God's work. St. Augustine says, We without God cannot. God without us will not. Let me repeat that. We without God cannot. We have not nothing. We can't do anything without God. But God without us will not. Or put it another way, do your best and God will do the rest. And that's what I want us to focus on. Do your best and God will do the rest. Too many times when I have a problem and I'm faced with an obstacle, I begin to worry. I can't solve this problem. I, I don't have enough money to solve this problem. I don't know how to solve this problem. I don't have enough time to solve this problem. Instead of thinking that negatively and starting to worry, I need to be positive about it and offer to Christ my five loaves and my two fish, which is way, way too small to feed 5,000 people, but I just place it in front of God at his feet and let him do the rest. But sometimes I think to myself, well, wait a minute, my best isn't good enough. It's just not enough. It's too little. It doesn't matter. Do your best and let God do the rest. Let me take, you guys know I'm um, a big baseball fan, and if you remember, I'm a Cubs fan, which is the worst kind of baseball fan. A couple of years ago, I think it was about three years ago, um, Aramis Ramirez, which is one of the Cubs' third baseman, one of the most talented players on the team, it was near the end of the season, the Cubs already losing, going nowhere, and he hit a uh, ground ball um, that was going to be an out, and he didn't run hard to first base, he just jogged slowly to first base, didn't run full speed ahead, and people were so angry with him. Why isn't he trying hard? Why isn't he trying his best? There's nothing more frustrating than to watch somebody with that kind of skill not trying hard enough. He probably was discouraged because the team was losing and it was a pretty difficult year for the team. It is said about athletes that the difference between a professional athlete like Aramis Ramirez, like Michael Jordan, and the average good athlete, the difference between a great athlete and a good athlete is not their skill. It's how hard they work and how hard they try. Anybody who's watched Michael Jordan, and if you remember when Michael Jordan was drafted, he wasn't drafted first. He wasn't considered the best one. There was two other basketball players chosen before him, before the, the Bulls got him. They were all equally skilled. At that level, whether it be baseball or basketball or football or any other sport, all these athletes are about the same level. They got there because they're very, very talented. The difference between the great ones, between the Michael Jordans and, and all the other great athletes, is that they work harder. They take that skill that they have and they really apply it to the fullest extent that they can. It's their desire to win. I want to th imagine, instead of me watching Aramis Ramirez hit that ground ball and not trying hard enough, there's, there's God, there's the angels, there's all the saints watching me. Am I trying hard? Am I putting in that same effort? Am I doing my best in my life with God? Or am I also kind of jogging my, my, my ground ball, not working hard enough? I need to be working to the fullest of my extent in everything. My personal life, my, my spiritual life, my, my family life and everything. I need to be trying my best. And God will bless that and do the rest. You look at the miracles that were accomplished in the, in the, by, by Jesus in the, Old, in the New Testament. They all required some sort of participation. Look of, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus was able to raise Lazarus from the dead after being dead for three days, but he asked help in rolling back the stone in his tomb. Did he really need that? 
Could he not have rolled that stone himself? Sure he could have. But he's looking for our participation. A, a great, a, another example of, of course, is the four friends of the paralyzed man who they did their best. They weren't discouraged that there was too many crowds and they couldn't get into the house where Jesus was staying for their friend to be healed by Jesus, but opened the roof and brought him down. They didn't give up. They tried their best. Zacchaeus, who was too short, and couldn't see Jesus walking by because of the crowds, tried his best and climbed the tree so that he can see Jesus better. And that wonderful effort, that full effort, that trying his best, got him to meet Jesus. So don't be like that athlete that frustrates the fan and doesn't try hard enough. Try your best, and God will do the rest. Whether it be in an exam you have coming up, whether it be an interview you have coming up, whether it be a big presentation you have coming up, do your best, and God will do the rest. The second part of it is, and for, for most part, what I focused on is myself, or focused on you yourselves. But the second part is, maybe I'm too focused on myself, I'm not focused enough on God. I'm too focused on what can God do for me, and not enough as to what I can do to God's fellow man. Which takes me to a very famous line that John F. Kennedy said on the day of his inauguration. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I think too many times our focus is, what can God do for me? What benefit can he give me if I really pray hard enough, he can give me what I want, my material blessings? That's wonderful, but remember, the focus should be on God and all those things we'd be taken care of. Our focus should not be on what God can do for us, but what my focus should be on God. Not only that, but I should be able to, fo I should focus on what God can do for God's children, my fellow man. Again, it's too easy not to get involved. There's others who are probably better at it than I am. Someone else would help God's fellow children. Someone with more money, someone with more talent, someone with more time. There's a lot of very poor people in the world. There are a lot, of, a lot of help, and it probably will take a lot of money to help those people. What can I do to help? I've, my, the money I have is nothing. It's a, it's a small drop in the bucket. Somebody like Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, they've got a lot more money than I can. You know, one simple check from them will solve somebody's problem. What can I do? Well, your dollar is a small amount. But that dollar, God will bless it and make it work miracles. Again, do your best and God will do the rest. Maybe I want to help teach Sunday school. Maybe I want to help make repairs in the church. But I don't know how to do it, so I'm just going to not do it. No. Your talent, you may not think your talent is enough, but in God's hands, your talent will work miracles. Maybe I want to help make Urban in the church, but I don't know how to do it and I don't have time to do it. It doesn't matter. You volunteer to do it and God will provide you the time that you need to do it. If I get involved, I might worry that I might get complicated or I might take too much of my time. Like I said, God will create that time for you. It's too easy to stay in your comfortable little world and not get involved. But getting involved will, will be its own blessing because God will bless your effort. When we offer help, even through the small, our offering is too small, even though our offering is, is not good enough. Even though our offering can be done better by somebody else, it doesn't matter, because God will use that effort because you're doing your best, and miracles will happen. Not only that, we need to help everyone, not just our friends, not just people like us, but Jesus has instructed us also to love our enemies. And um, many of the church fathers looked at the miracle today of the feeding of the 5,000 and saw a lot of symbolism in it. One of the symbols used is the 12 baskets left over, Obviously, number 12 is very important, and, and many church fathers have looked at that and said it represents the 12, uh, the 12 disciples. Well, if it represents the 12 disciples, St. John Chrysostom had a wonderful meditation on that, because guess who was one of the 12 disciples? It was Judas. And Jesus even provided for him generously, knowing that he would be his betrayer. If Jesus knew that he, that he, that he who would betray him even provided for him generously with love, I also need to be generous with all those I encounter. Not only those who are my friends, not only those who are like me, but everybody I encounter. A wonderful example of the generosity, the kind of generosity, and I'll end with this example, that wonderful generosity that, that God wants us to have is, um, you guys, I'm sure, get many calls from, example, the Salvation Army or Goodwill, calling you and saying, do you have any old clothing or, or some you know, leftover items in your house that you'd like to donate? Well, this woman, when she gets that call, always says, yes. Yes, I always have something. 
And when it, she knows the day is coming where the salvation is coming to pick up her old clothes, she doesn't give them her old clothes. She goes to the store and buys brand new clothing and gives it to the Salvation Army and keeps the old clothes for herself. That's what God is talking about when he asks us to give generously and to try and to do our best. Let us focus on God for us to do what we can, the best that we can, and then miracles will happen because of our generosity and because our focus is on God. As long as our lives focus on him, and not on ourselves. Remember my key word for t- my key sentence for today: Do your best, and God will do the rest. And glory be to God forever. Amen.